I love the fourth verse of that song every time we sing it. Hebrews 1.8, but of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. Tonight, we're going to talk about politics and faith, politics and religion, and you're all of a sudden kind of squirming in your seat wondering, oh no, where is this going to go? We get extremely uncomfortable sometimes when you think about uh, the intersection of those two categories. You may get excited if it's something you agree about in a hearty amen. You may get a, wow, that's uh, something we shouldn't do from the pulpit if it's something you may disagree with. But I want to talk about a nation that I'm very patriotic about. I want to talk about a leader, a ruler that I show my allegiance to and full support of. I think of some of the greatest nations in history and how what People magazine recently produced an article on the, some of the greatest civilizations uh, in present or past history. And there were nations on there like Rome, the United Kingdom, China, Greece, Egypt, uh, ancient Babylon, ancient Assyria, India, uh, the Persian Empire. And of course, the United States of America made uh, this top 10 list. And the thing about all of these nations, I could go through uh, the history of, of the way they were formed and the accomplishments that they did and even some of their falls. You would see that all of them had something in common and is that with every great nation has had it, their flaws to it. I think about some of the greatest rulers of all time. Uh, Winston Churchill, Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar, uh, Napoleon, George Washington, uh, Abraham Lincoln, I could go on and on and on. And all of those might have some neat story, might make some incredible movie of some sort. But the thing is, they all had flaws still. No matter how great of a leader or someone that we show our respect to, they weren't perfect. They had a flaw. And so the person in which, the, the person in which I show my allegiance to, the one that I believe uh, that needs our support, is one that had been prophesied since the beginning of time. It was a ruler that was to be a descendant of Shem, the, the, the son of Noah. He was, as prophecy goes, to be the descendant of Abraham, of, of Isaac, the descendant of Jacob, of Judah, of Jesse, the descendant of David, to be born in a small city, to be born of a virgin. The prophecy continues in saying that during his life he would perform miracles, he would uh, speak in parables. The prophecy said that he would enter Jerusalem riding on a donkey and be hated for no reason. He would be betrayed by a friend for 30 pieces of silver. The prophecy continues in saying that he would open his mouth, uh, not his mouth, to defend himself. He would be beaten and spit upon. Uh, the, the, the scriptures, the prophecy goes on to say that he would be numbered with the transgressors, uh, be pierced. His hands and his feet would be pierced, but none of his bones would be broken. People would cast lots for his clothes. He would be buried with the rich. His body was not to decay as the prophecy continues. As it says, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. He was to ascend into heaven and be seated at the right hand of God, ruling as head of his kingdom. It was as his predecessor would say before he came on the scene, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And when this ruler came on the scene, this, this king that I'm talking about, he said the exact same words, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He would teach his followers to say, to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It would be this king that people would shout, Hosanna, Hosanna, the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. It was this king, after all of this, would say, it is finished. He came to do what he came to accomplish. And of course, you know, I'm talking about our king, our, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, Jesus the Christ. This is the king that I show my support to, the one that I show my allegiance to. Because not only does prophesy point to him and everything now points back to him, uh, he's worthy of the kingship. He came to establish a kingdom. He said in Mark chapter 9, verse 1, to those who were there with him, saying, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until you see the kingdom of God come with power. 
you know, there was a sense of confusion. You know, after Jesus had already been resurrected, they, they knew that they weren't supposed to taste death, some of them, until they saw the kingdom come with power. And so they asked a question in, in Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. So when they came together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And so those who were there knew that they, some of them weren't going to taste death. And so they saw the kingdom come with power. Jesus says, wait until uh, the, the power when the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And we know what happens a few verses later in chapter 2 in the day of Pentecost when the church is established and formed and uh, just a tremendous occasion there in the day of Pentecost. It was Jesus who said, uh, you know, who do men say that I am? And some said, you know, they said some say uh, Elijah or Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he goes, but who do you say I am? And Peter says in, in Matthew 16, verse 18, but I tell you, or Jesus said, but I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell or Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Jesus said that, you know, Peter, I'm going to build my church uh, on this rock, the rock that I am the son of God, that I am the son of God, that I'm going to give you the keys to this kingdom, a kingdom that Jesus would explain in various passages like John 18, 36, uh, my kingdom is not of this world. It was this, this kingdom that was different than all the kingdoms in history. He would tell those who would become Christians uh, through inspiration, Paul wrote in Colossians 1, 13, that he delivered us from the domain of darkness and he transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. It was this kingdom that's talked about in the book of Revelation in the first chapter in verses 4 through 6. In Revelation 1, it says, John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and ruler of kings on earth to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and his key and made us a kingdom priest to his God and father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever it was his kingdom uh, that's talked about in the book of Daniel a picture that I used from world video Bible school a, a, a very attractive poster trying to break down uh, the prophecy in, in Daniel chapter 2 of when this kingdom the kingdom of God would be established and he, and he talks about this great image in chapter 2 and he, he talks about how Babylon was that was the king, was the gold head in that uh, in that account and then he talked about the arms and the chest that that kingdom would be later explained to be the Medo-Persian Empire, world kingdom, world ruling kingdom. And then after that in history would come uh, another kingdom, would be the belly and the thighs of bronze being the Greek Empire. And then as time would go on, it would be these legs of iron which would be represented in the Roman Empire. And as Daniel 2 verse 44 says, as that chapter begins to wrap up, it would be in the days of those kings during the Roman Empire where the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall there be a kingdom to be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. That's the kingdom of God. It's the kingdom that we are a part of, that we were transferred from uh, the domain of darkness and brought into this kingdom the kingdom that jesus said that he would build uh, build uh, his church it's his kingdom as the hebrew writer says in chapter 12 verses 28 through 29 therefore let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken and thus let us offer to god acceptable worship with reverence and awe for our god is a consuming fire we're part of an incredible kingdom the kingdom of God is this universal kingdom that has uh, no physical boundaries. You know, I think about, you know, physical Israel in Numbers 34 where there were some boundaries that were described there. But as being part of spiritual Israel, part of the church, part of the kingdom, I think about what's said in Acts chapter 17. In Acts 17 and verses uh, 26 through 30. Where Paul, as he's standing there, Mars Hill makes these, these powerful statements by inspiration. 
Acts 17, verse 26. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the earth, face of the earth, having determined a lot of periods and their boundaries of their dwelling places, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and we move and we have our very being. For as even some of our own prophets, of your own prophets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by art in the imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. All people everywhere have this invitation, this open immigration policy in a sense, an open legal immigration policy to enter the kingdom of God. That we can go through, as John chapter 10 richly describes, the door to go through uh, Christ. We have this, this immigration policy when it comes to the kingdom of God where anybody can become a citizen of the kingdom of God by going through Christ. Philippians 3.20 but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We have this constitution, in a sense, in the kingdom of God. We have, we have the scriptures, the word. As Second Peter 1, 3 says, that it gives us all things that pertain to life and godliness. We're in this kingdom that has organization. It wasn't established and organized by a group of intelligent religious men, but God gave us this organization. He gave us a plan. He gave us this body, uh, Ephesians 4.4, 4, with Christ being the head of that body, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. In the book of Ephesians, it talks about some of the organization and how it says in Ephesians 4, verse 11 and 12, that, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ. He gave us organization, the pattern in which the congregations, his kingdom would be uh, led, where you would have elders and deacons and the saints, as Philippians 1.1 1, 1 begins, begins that letter. Uh, 1 Timothy 3 and Titus chapter 1, showing the qualifications of the leadership within the kingdom of God. Uh, the kingdom of God, we had this flag, this banner that we can hold that, that's mentioned in 1 Samuel 7 verse 12, this banner, till this Ebenezer, till now the Lord has helped us. We have, in a sense, a tax code. You know, remember what happens in Luke chapter 20 and verse 25. You know, should we pay taxes? And he, he gets the coin, where there's Caesar, and he said, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, but render to God the things that are God's. We have a spiritual tax code. We, have a, we can have national pride for the kingdom of God. We can have this intense patriotism when it comes to being part of the kingdom of God, being part of the church of Jesus Christ. You know, I think of 1 Corinthians 1.31, you know, where it talks about, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. You know, there's another passage about boasting in Galatians 6 verse 14, a good kind of boasting, I suppose, where it says uh, in Galatians 6.14, but far be it from me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. So we can have this patriotism. We can uh, boast in the Lord and the cross and salvation and, and, and everything that he's done for us, giving us this kingdom, giving us, there we go, <laughs> giving us this constitution, this organization. We can actually enlist in, in this military as, as part of being citizens of the kingdom. We're all automatically part of this, this military force, following the Prince of Peace, Isaiah 9, 6, as our commander. And doing, putting on the, the whole armor of God, Ephesians 6, and, and with it all possible to live peaceful lives with our fellow man and with others, to do good to all, especially those of the household of faith. You know, I love our country. I really do. I love the United States of America. If you have ever been to another country before for whatever reason, business, missions, and then you come back. I know every time I land back at DFW Airport, I'm like, Oh, this is home, home sweet home, back in Texas, back to where they has all my favorite places to enjoy, a country where I get to raise my family, a country that has a tremendous amount of opportunities, opportunities for fun, for leisure, for work, for, for means of income, 
a, a place where I can worship freely in spirit and truth, a, a place where I can you know, proudly support our troops and be thankful for, for just everything that the U.S. of A. can provide. But despite of how patriotic I am for our country, I'm more patriotic for something else. And the thing is, and I've already made the disclaimer, I love our country, but the country, America, is not the church. The America is not the kingdom of God. It's a great place to be part of the kingdom of God, but the kingdom of God is much bigger than sometimes we think. I challenge you, if you ever get the opportunity to go somewhere else where the church is meeting in another country and to worship there, you'll see how we're part of something bigger. We're part of something universal. We're part of something eternal. And it's just amazing to be part of the king, following the king and his kingdom. And so what I want to think about is Matthew 6, 33, a simple verse. We sing it all the time where it says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You know, and these things will be added unto you. A very common passage that we're familiar with, that seek first the kingdom of God. This idea of seeking first the kingship of God, seeking first that relationship that we have with God, God being our king and we being part of his kingdom and this relationship that we have with him. That is what is the most important thing in, in life. You know, I'm going to list here about three or four brief points uh, tonight about just simply things that can distract us, things that we might wrap our minds around, we might get very passionate about, things that just simply distract us. I can't think of another word when it comes to making us forget about our, the kingship of God, forgetting about what's really important, the king in his kingdom. I think about this age of, of, we're in the political season time right now, and there's all sorts of political differences that we may have with friends, with family, with those that are around us. You know, we're watching debates on TV. If you're like me, you listen to, to talk radio and you try to stay current and, and say, what's, what's the current news? What's the current swing? What's the current issue that's going on right now? You know, if, you, if I think about my whole Twitter account, it's mostly only news organizations so I can get up to the second breaking news, not even up to the minute, up to the second. Sometimes I feel like it posts it before the event even happens. And, and, and we're just in this whole, all around us are issues, current events, political differences. And I don't know about you, I get discouraged. You know, sometimes when I'm listening to my radio show on the way home, it kind of brings me down a little bit. Maybe I ought not to do that as much, I suppose. I think about scandals in the news. I think about local and state and national, even world stage scandals. I think about that when someone on TV makes some sort of political comment that there's fact checks these days. That's a sad statement that we actually have to do fact checks to prove if, if something said is truthful or not. That, that's sad that we've come down to that. And so it, it just keeps pointing me back. What's really important? There's going to be things that I don't like that happen. There's going to be votes that don't go the way that I really want them to go. Things in which I'm passionate about, but they just don't turn out the way that I want them to. But I've got to remember and point myself back to the big picture. I'm part of something bigger. I follow the king, and I'm following and being part of his kingdom. You know, I'm not a pacifist. I really appreciate the prayer that was led earlier. The scriptures teach us that we're to pray for, for our leaders. We're to pray for peace. You know, 1 Timothy is probably one of the best passages. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. As Christians, this is what we're commanded to do. 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 through 3. First of all, then I urge that supplications and prayers and intercessions and thanksgivings be made for all people, by the way. Not just our people that we support. All people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and it's pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior. You know, I often in my prayers, I remember this verse. I remember to pray for my leaders and pray for our country. But sometimes I forget about it. Again, I got to pray for the other leaders too. It was mentioned in the prayer, pray with all the world leaders uh, around the world. You know, I think about Christians who are sitting in a pulpit in another part of the world who are praying for their nation. We should pray for all of our world leaders. You know, 1 Peter 2, 17 sometimes steps on my toes a little bit. And what I mean by that is where it says in 1 Peter 2, 17, honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. 
a commandment that's written during a time where there was a, a lot of political corruption. There were leaders who hated Christians and would have killed them for their faith. And yet it says, honor the emperor, respect the emperor, respect the governing authorities. That's hard for me sometimes to do. And I think about, I don't have it as bad as some of these Christians did in the first century. I think about Daniel 4 in verse 17, where the scripture teaches that, that we may know that the most high rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will and sets over it the lowliest of men. I don't get how that works. I really don't. My, my little finite mind can't get around God's uh, infinite mind and his wisdom and the way that he orchestrates things and works through providence and behind the scenes. I don't, I don't get it, but I know that he does. I know that Romans 13, 1 says that let every person be subject to governing authorities for there is no authority except from God and those who exist have been instituted by God. You know, I can make a number of points here. I really could. I could get in a soapbox. And this is really what these four points are, just four simple thoughts. But all these come down to our distractions. Sometimes we get distracted. I believe that you know, we have the right as being citizens, as, as Christians, to make a peaceful society. That's what the whole purpose of praying for our leaders. It says that we can have a peaceful and quiet life. That's, I want that. Christians should want to, 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 to vote for things that are for God's will and not contrary to his will. We should have a desire to create a good society to worship and to grow and to, and to be a member of the kingdom in. But those can become a distraction. We've got to remember something bigger. What's bigger is the king in his kingdom. That's what's important. When things don't go our way, when we shake our head, think about something that we're part of. We're part of something bigger. I think of the moral corruption that surrounds us. I'll just make a few sub-points here. The, the moral corruption is, you know, just, I, I saw a movie just last week, a PG-13 movie, which in the past, you know, I thought I could go see a PG-13 movie without compromising, I suppose, my convictions. And, and, and I was watching this movie, and it was a good movie, and it was, it was entertaining, it was awesome, it was fun. But they threw in some words in that movie that I could not believe were in a PG-13 movie. I'm trying to keep this as general as possible. Words that, if they were said in a movie, would automatically make them a rated R movie. Let's just say that. But it's become so mainstream language, uh, curse words, that make me uncomfortable, that it's now getting a PG-13 rating. I, I just couldn't believe it. And a number of them, the rating system has now changed, where you can use certain words and still get the PG-13 rating. They come right up to the, to the line where before it crosses over, I guess, into the R category. It really is a reflection of society. That a movie like Fifty Shades of Grey would make $166 million in the box office. That, that's sad. That we are spending money, when I say we, generally speaking, money to, to watch movies like that, which just entices them to make more and more movies like that because they know they'll generate the income. It's just sad when we look around. Sometimes we don't know how to respond. We, we tear up. We get angry. We, we whatever. Sometimes it even gets the best of us, and we, we support it ourselves. And I just and I think about the, the moral corruption around us. There's an organization out there called GLAAD, G-L-A-A-D. And, and it used to be an acronym that stood for uh, the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Def Against Defamation Organization. They actually quit making it an acronym. They're still called GLAAD, but they want it to be more inclusive of, of transgenderism and other issues. And, and what they do as an organization, they are a strong force in going through different movies and TV shows and, and rating them to see how LGBT friendly they are. And I mentioned this maybe a couple years ago in a lesson, and it, this organization is just booming. They'll boycott shows that are not LGBT friendly, and, and they want to make sure uh, it's represented in all television shows, uh, in all movies as best as possible. You know, I think about, uh, I was reading the fiscal 2000 report uh, of Planned Parenthood, and almost with joy in, in, in saying, look how many abortions were performed this year. They said they did in 2014, 327,653. And, and the spokesperson had this quote to say, we've come a long way since Margaret Sanger was jailed in 1916 for opening America's first birth control clinic. And the report says before the, uh, the organization's advocate thanked their supporters uh, for supporting them. 
I think about, you know, immorality. I don't really don't want to talk about this too long because it just brings me down. Uh, you know, June 25th, 20, or 26, 2015 this year, you know, the same-sex marriage uh, ruling that we, we're all aware of. And I think about, you know, we've had issues for a long time with immorality. We, even traditional marriage has had their own struggles. The divorce rates are, are, are sad. The, the promiscuity uh, is just the norm in society. I even uh, I looked at an article of the top uh, two of the top trending costumes this year. Two of the top trending costumes for, for, uh, for Halloween this year are, are Bruce Jenner the Olympian and then Caitlyn Jenner. Those are two of the top trending costumes that and people are buying them. People are buying them up. And again, we just look around and we go, what do I do? You know, what is my, what is my reaction? We get, like I said, some of you get angry, some of you get mad, some of you get sad. And sometimes we just have to stop for a minute and say, you know what? This is temporary. <laughs> I'm part of something bigger. I serve someone who is eternal. I'm part of this kingdom. I'm part of something that's, that's real and that's going to endure. These are just temporary fads, temporary issues, and I'm going to get past it. I'm going to get past it. I can't let this weigh me down. I can't let this distraction overwhelm me to the point where it distracts my relationship with God. The, the anger that can boil up, and i got to say, wait a second. I'm seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You know, I, I could go on about the idea of stress and you know, you think of a project that's coming up. You think of a test you have next week. You think of a boss who's getting on your nerves or just the workload that's coming up. You think of uh, your debt and your health issues that you may have. And all of these uh, temporary trials just bring us down. And what they end up becoming are a distraction. And that we, again, have to stop for a moment as Christians and remember that our entire lifespan, James 4 says, is a mist. So the issues we go through, the, the trials, the temporary trials, are all, I don't even know what the word is for something that's shorter than a mist. If our whole lifespan is defined as a mist, the, the issue is less than a mist. And, and I th it's just part of it. You know, I've, I mention this verse every single sermon I'm in because it is like my go-to perspective verse on Christianity. And it's 2 Corinthians 4, 16 and 18, and, and I'll read it again because it's powerful. That it helps me when I think about an issue I'm going for through that this is short term compared to the long term ahead of me. And it, and it says this. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory. Beyond all comparison as we look to the things that are seen, or not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient or temporary, but the things that are unseen are temporary. It, to me, that just always helps me out. It always helps me remember the king and his kingdom. It helps me to remember the eternal life that is ahead of the child of God and, and not to dwell on the, the temporary stress and the issues that, that will pass. And if they don't pass now, for those who love God, all things eventually are going to work together for good, Romans 8, 28. Another issue that I'll just spend a few moments talking about is uh, the idea of church divisions. And what I mean by that is um, like denominationalism, the idea of the kingdom of God just being divided and corrupted and changed. And, and, and I don't know, I can't even think of the word that comes to mind. At times I get perplexed. At times I get confused. At times I've even talked to friends. When I first became a Christian, I would ask friends of mine, hey, can I, I want to study the, the, the scriptures with you. And they'd be like, oh, I don't do that organized religion stuff. Too confusing, too many divisions. And it, and it brings me down. At times when I think about uh, divisions with, for, with, for the kingdom of God, the, the single kingdom of God, I, I get mad because I think of how uh, Jesus, when he was talking to the religious leaders, would say, woe to you. He got fired up when he thought about how they were corrupting uh, faith. And part of me, when I think of the leaders of these groups, I get mad. I'm like, how can you teach something that is completely contrary to the Bible? And, and, and I could go on and on about some of the thoughts that come to mind when I think about the kingdom trying to be divided up and, and supposed divisions within Christianity. Uh, there's a book I read uh, this year that I would recommend you reading. It's called uh, Muscle and the Shovel. In this book, it's this, this, the writer is telling his story of discovering truth, discovering uh, the kingdom of God and how he was able to, to kind of, I guess, test out 
other groups and trying to navigate his way and trying to say, where is the truth being taught? And, and, and here's a couple quotes from the introduction of his book. He said, if you choose to read this book, your beliefs will be challenged in ways you never thought possible and from a vantage point you have never considered. It will force you to examine the beliefs you hold close to your heart, but you won't finish this book until, without being satisfied. If your sensibilities are easily offended, this story is probably not for you. In fact, many who begin this story won't make it to the end of the book. And those who do will find something far more valuable than the purchase price of the book. You know, I, I, I followed the author of the book, and, and on Twitter the other day, he said that as a result of people using that book as a guide to their study, that there has been 35,000 baptisms. And, and, that, and that is tremendous. I know people you know, in this room who, who were able to use it as a guide in, in their, their search for truth. And, and sometimes it just gets so confusing. It brings us down. And when you think about the idea of church divisions, I just want to go back to the king and the kingdom. That's what it's about. Simple New Testament Christianity. Following the king, being part of his kingdom, trying our best to do what God says in his word, and just make it simple. Try not to complicate things and adding our own wants and desires and, and leaving the pattern of the word. Let's just stick with the scriptures. And that helps me. It helps me sometimes to know that I'm not ultimately the judge of, a, of, a, of another denominational group. But I do know what the scripture teaches in that G Jesus said the word that in John 12, 48, his word is the standard. It's the word that we'll be judged by. And I just want to do what it says as best as I can. And it helps me to know that I can have confidence in my faith and not wonder if I'm in the kingdom of God or not in the kingdom of God. I can know I'm in the kingdom of God. That's what 1 John 5.13 says. I write these things to you that you may know that you are in the kingdom of God. And it just helps. Sometimes when you, when you drive down a, a major road, 1709, and you see churches, 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 and, and I'm just thinking, where did all these names come from? What are they, why do they do this or teach that there? And I just go back. I'm part of something bigger. I, I know whom I believe. I know I'm part of his kingdom. And I'm just going to, I want to do that and not to bring myself down, not to get distracted by religious confusion and just stick with pure, unadulterated New Testament Christianity. I think, uh, I just summarize some of these thoughts here. The king and his kingdom, that's what it's about. You know, there's all sorts of distractions when it comes to seeking first the kingdom of God. We may get really entangled in, in our, our nation's issues, political dis differences and disagreements, we may get brought down by the, the moral corruption that's around us and just, just shake our head in, in disgust or shake our head in like why or, or, or just shake our head and just cry because we just don't know what to do sometimes. We may get, <clears throat> when we think about uh, the stresses in our life, they just distract us. When we get frustrated, when we have a, a major health scare or, or when, then when we think about just what it means to be part of the church and we, and we look around and see all sorts of differences that are out there, we just have to go back to the big picture again. It's about the king and his kingdom. It's about our relationship with God. It's about that kingship that we desire. We're part of something big, something universal, and something real. So what we're going to do here is we're going to sing a song. And uh, during that invitation song, if, uh, if, if, you don't, if you're not part of the kingdom, we, we would implore you, uh, we would kindly want to persuade you if possible force you but we can't force you to become part of the kingdom of god to accept the lord as your king as cameron did as he stood here this morning and said i believe jesus christ is the son of god and went down under the water came up knowing that he was part of the kingdom and that he was searching now uh, he is seeking after the kingship of god the kingdom of god if you haven't done that yet do that please we, we got time and and the invitation's open right now, a very, very appropriate time to do that. But if you have something that uh, you would like prayers about, maybe some sort of distraction that's going on in your life, something not big picture, and you want us to help you, to pray with you as a brother or sister in Christ, uh, uh, as a congregation, let you know we're part of the universal kingdom. It, it's going to be okay. We got something eternal that awaits us. We can, we can pray with you. So whatever your need is, you can come forward now while we stand and we sing.